Welcome to my 100% free course on ISACA's Certified Information Security Manager, CISM, certification. This is one of the hottest certifications in the industry and is excellent for people who want to move to a leadership position in IT security. CISM will give you authority and credibility in the industry as a cybersecurity leader or manager. If you have been following my channel, I will cover Domain 3 so let us get started. Check out my video on Domains 1 and 2 if you have not done so. You will need the fundamentals of Domains 1 and 2 to proceed with Domain 2. Let's go CISM Professional. Sharing is caring, please subscribe, like and share. It will be good to share cybersecurity knowledge. Click the bell so you can get the latest update on this channel. It is the hope to grow the community towards a cyber safe world. This is a channel all about technology and technology lifestyle. Let's let grow cybersecurity knowledge together. Domain 3 comprises 33% of the overall CISM information security management areas. It is called an information security program and comprises two topics, mainly information security program development and information security program management. These will be the fundamental concepts that CISM will need to know. Information security does not exist in a vacuum and needs to be run as a program, which we will discuss in this domain. Let's buckle up and let us all sail through the CISM domain towards our professional careers. We will think about running a proper information security program in this domain. Put yourself as the project manager managing the whole cybersecurity program in your organization. You will need to think long term and develop the best for your company to balance business risk and finances. Establishing and modernizing an organization's cybersecurity program is one of the most impactful activities with long term benefits and consequences a security leader will undertake. Cybersecurity program improvements are implemented as a result of a strategic plan that we discussed earlier. This is a critical process to ensure your company's cybersecurity posture is in the best position. Cybersecurity program development includes creating policies, controls, standards, requirements, guidelines, and a formal structure for security functions described in separate charters. Information security programs comprise a collection of activities to identify, communicate, and address risks. The security program consists of controls, processes, and practices intended to increase the resilience of the computing environment and ensure that risks are known and handled effectively. The starting point of an information security program. A single individual may hold these activities in a smaller organization. In contrast, Organizations will have a security leader who leads an internal team. Organizations of all sizes may need additional support from external partners. And what is the key we need to know? Such a program needs a top-down approach with C-level or top management support. With all the planning done, we need to understand that this will be the doing part after planning the strategy. Security program models have been developed that include the primary activities needed in any organization's security program. However, because every organization is different, each security manager needs to understand their organization's internal workings so that their security programs can effectively align with the organization's operations, practices, and culture. A charter is a formal, written definition of the objectives of a program its primary timelines, the sources of funding, the names of its principal leaders and managers, and the business executives sponsoring the program. In many organizations, a program charter document is approved by the CEO or executive leader, giving authority to the person or group that runs the program. The charter also demonstrates the support from the executive leadership team. An information security program charter gives authority to the security leader to develop and perform several functions, including the following. 1. Develop and enforce the security policy. 2. Develop and implement the risk management process. 3. Develop and manage security governance. 4. Develop and direct the implementation and operation of controls across department or business unit boundaries. Five. 
develop and direct the implementation of key security processes, including vulnerability management, incident management, third-party risk, security architecture, business continuity planning, and security awareness training. With all the functions defined, we can now define the program's objectives. This includes timelines, funding and staff behaviors. Understanding all the factors affecting your company will help to work out a better schedule. Information security in an organization of any size is a team sport. And we will need a leader like senior management to authorize and support the program. The security manager, with or without staff, does not perform security functions alone. Rather, these activities involve nearly every other department, business unit, and affiliate in the organization. For this reason, the security charter must be ratified by executive management. A security charter that designates the security manager as the person responsible for implementing the program does not give the security manager the right to dictate the program to others. So what is consists part of the information security program? First, we will have the scope. An early step in the creation of an information security program is the definition of its scope. Management needs to define the departments, business units, affiliates, and locations to be included in the organization's information security program. The scope of a program is essential because it defines the boundaries and what parts of the organization are to be included and subject to information security governance and policy. The main objective is for us to know what we need to cover. Second will be information security processes. Information security programs include numerous business processes that fulfill the overall mission of information and information systems protection. These processes fall into three major categories risk and compliance, architecture, and operations. Processes are for us to understand how we will do it. Finally, we will have information security technologies. Modern information security includes essential business processes such as risk and policy management, but it is also heavily involved in information technology. After all, information security's mission is protecting all things IT. To scale with the power and speed of IT, Information security has its own portfolio of protective and detective technologies such as firewall, endpoints, anti-malware, DLP, IDS, IPS. We will also review the below in the technologies portion. Dynamic Application Security Testing, DAST. Static Application Security Testing, SAST. Penetration Testing. Code Review. Governance, Risk, and Compliance GRC, Platform Integrated Risk Management IRM, Platform Assets are the things of value that an organization protects in an information security program. They consist of tangible things, including the following. Information systems hardware, servers, laptops, tablets, mobile devices, and network devices of various sorts. Software, operating systems, subsystems, applications, and tools regardless of location. Virtual assets, operating system guests, containers, and so on. Information, structured databases and unstructured data. Facilities, data centers, development centers, operations centers, business offices, sales offices, retail locations, and so on. Personnel, staff, contractors, temporary workers. Information classification. Information classification is a process whereby different sets and collections of data in an organization are analyzed for various types of value, criticality, integrity, and sensitivity. There are other ways to understand these characteristics. These are some examples. Monetary value. Some information may be easily monetized by intruders who steal it, such as credit card numbers, bank account numbers, gift certificates or cards, and discount or promotion codes. Loss of this type of information may cause direct financial losses. Operational criticality. This information must be available at all times, or perhaps the information is related to some factors of business resilience. 
Examples include virtual server images, incident response procedures, and business continuity procedures. Corruption or loss of this information may significantly impact ongoing business operations. Accuracy or integrity. Information in this category is required to be highly accurate. If altered, the organization could suffer significant financial or reputational harm. Examples include exchange rate tables, product or service inventory data, machine calibration data, and price lists. Corruption or loss of this information impacts business operations by causing incomplete or erroneous transactions. Sensitivity Information is commonly associated with individual citizens, including personal contact information, financial data such as credit card and bank account numbers, and medical records. Reputational value. Another dimension of classification, denoting the potential loss of reputation should particular sensitive or critical information be lost or compromised. Information such as customers' personal information fits here. Most organizations store information that falls into all of those categories, with degrees of importance within them. Though this may result in a complex matrix of information types and degrees of importance or value, the most successful organizations will build a relatively simple information classification scheme. For instance, an organization may develop four levels of information classification, such as the following. Secret. Restricted. Confidential. Public. Once an organization is satisfied that its information classification is in order, it can embark on system classification. Like various information assets, information systems can also be classified according to different security and operational criteria. System classification is similar to the purpose for information criteria, to identify and categorize system assets according to the classification of information stored, processed, or transmitted by them so that an appropriate level of protection can be determined and implemented. A typical approach to system classification and protection is this, for each level of classification and each type of system, a system hardening standard is developed that specifies the features and configuration settings to be applied to the system. These settings help make the system resistant to attack, and in some cases, the grounds will help protect the information being stored, processed, or transmitted by the systems. Therefore, we will need to secure each system according to its criticality. This reflects system classification. Some examples will help illustrate these points. 1. Database Management Server A database management server stores information, perhaps credit card data, at a restricted classification level. The system will be classified as restricted, and the organization will develop system hardening standards for the operating and database management systems. 2. Demilitarized Zone DMZ, Firewall a firewall protects servers located in a DMZ from threats on the Internet and protects the organization's internal assets from the DMZ if an attacker compromises an asset in the DMZ. Though the firewall does not store information, it protects information by restricting the types of traffic from the Internet to systems upon which the information resides. The organization will develop and implement hardening standards for the firewall. 3. Internet Time Server a server provides precise time clock data to other servers, network devices, and end-user workstations. Although the time server itself does not store, process, or transmit sensitive information, it is classified as restricted because it has direct access, via time protocols and possibly other protocols, to classify as restricted assets. This server will be hardened according to hardening standards developed by the organization. Now. We understand that not all systems are created equal. With different types of data and their classifications, other systems need to be handled differently. So, if all systems are created unequally, we must apply different security standards. In this way, we will be able to identify the right tools and services to protect and secure the system accordingly to their needs. These are the values which CISM will be able to bring into the company. We live in an era of numerous information security standards and frameworks some for many years. 
This enables information security managers to get a head start on developing controls, policies, and standards instead of starting with a clean slate. There are several types of frameworks in information security, and sometimes they are confused with one another. Control Frameworks CIS CSC ISO.-IEC 27002 NIST SP853 PCI DSS NIST CSF Carbon ETS Sci Technical Report TR 103-3051, Pi Trust, CSF, and others. These frameworks are starting points for organizations that need to implement security controls and do not want to start from scratch. Risk Management Frameworks ISO slash IEC 27005, ISO slash IEC 31000, NIST, CSF, and NIST. SP 837. These frameworks provide the blueprints for a risk management lifecycle program. Architecture Frameworks These include TOGAF and SACMAN. Security Program Management Frameworks Include ISO slash IEC 27001, NIST, CSF, Cobin, and ETSI, TR 103-787-1. Note that some of these standards appear in more than one category. Some are multi-purpose in nature. For instance, NIST. CSF prescribes a risk management methodology and includes control mapping. Knowing all the standards and certifications will enable cybersecurity leaders to perform their tasks. Do you want to be the CISM whom the management can rely on and carry out the full responsibility? Security policy development is foundational to any organization's information security program. An information security policy defines the principles and required actions for the organization to adequately protect its assets and personnel. The audience for security policy is the organization's personnel not only its full-time and part-time employees but also its temporary workers, including contractors and consultants. Security policy must be accessible by all personnel so they can never offer ignorance as an excuse for violating policy. To this point, many organizations require all personnel to acknowledge the existence of and understand the organization's security policy at the time of hire and periodically, usually annually, thereafter. Alignment with controls. Security policy and controls need to be in alignment. This is not to say that there must be a control for every policy or a policy for every control, but policies and controls must not contradict each other. For example, suppose a control states that no personally owned mobile devices may connect to internal networks. In that case, the policy cannot state that those devices may be used, provided no corporate information is stored on them. It also makes sense for the structure of policies and controls to resemble one another. This alignment makes it easier for personnel to become familiar with the structure and content of policies and controls. Alignment with the audience. Security policy needs to align with the audience. In most organizations, this means that policy statements need to be understood by most workers. A common mistake in developing security policy is the inclusion of highly technical policies such as permitted encryption algorithms or statements about the hardening of servers. Such topics are irrelevant to most workers. The danger of including policies that are irrelevant to most workers is that they are likely to tune out and not pay attention to those policies that apply to them. In other words, the security policy should have a high signal-to-noise ratio. In organizations with extensive uses of technology, one avenue is to create a general security policy for all workers, technical and non-technical, and a separate policy for technical workers who design, build, and maintain information systems. Another alternative is to create a general security policy for all workers that states that all controls are mandatory. Either approach would be sufficient by aligning messages about policy with various audiences. To sum it up, what we need to keep in mind when developing a policy. 
The cybersecurity leader needs to know the laws and regulations to ensure the organization will not break the law or regulation. Next will be risk tolerance, what is the risk level the company can accept. We will also need to know the controls in place. The existing controls must not affect the new controls. And what new controls will need to purchase. Finally, we will need to understand the culture, and this will provide the best understanding to implement the best program. Security metrics are often used to observe technical IT security controls and processes and determine whether they are operating correctly. This helps management better understand the impact of past decisions and can help drive future decisions. Examples of technical metrics include the following. Firewall metrics. Number and types of rules triggered. Intrusion detection, prevention system, IDPS, metrics. Number and types of incidents detected or blocked, and target systems. Anti-malware metrics. Number and types of malware blocked and targeted systems. Other security system metrics. Measurements from DLP systems, web content filtering systems, CASB systems, and so on. These metrics allow one to know whether the security is working or not. While applicable, these metrics do not address the bigger picture of the effectiveness or alignment of an organization's overall security program. They do not answer critical questions that boards of directors and executive management often ask, such as the following. How much security is enough? How should security resources be invested and applied? What is the potential impact of a threat event? We need to know and determine if it can be qualitative or quantitative. These and other business-related questions can be addressed through the appropriate metrics, as addressed in the remainder of this section. Security strategists sometimes think about metrics in simple categorization, such as the following. Key Risk Indicators KRIs. Metrics associated with risk measurement. Key Goal Indicators KGIs. Metrics that portray the attainment of strategic goals. Key Performance Indicators KPIs. Metrics that show the efficiency or effectiveness of security-related activities. Metrics do not need to be technical, we can use other frameworks or methods to work on the metrics. For metrics to be effective, they need to be measurable. A common way to ensure the quality and effectiveness of a metric is to use the SMART method. A SMART metric is Specific Measurable Attainable Relevant Timely Information security program management includes several activities to ensure that organizational objectives are met. These activities include resource management, staff, professional services, budget, and equipment, decision-making at every level, and coordination of activities through projects, tasks, and routine operations. We are almost halfway through our Domain 3, Keep Focus SISM. The Procedures mechanisms, systems, and other measures designed to reduce risk through compliance with policies are known as controls. An organization develops controls to ensure that its business objectives will be met, risks will be reduced, and errors will be prevented or corrected. Controls are created to ensure desired outcomes and to avoid unwanted outcomes. Controls can also seem like a checkpoint for cybersecurity leaders to know what is missing and what needs to be implemented. It also allows long-term planning and keeps the controls in place. Controls are created for several reasons. The reasons include the followings. Regulation. A regulation on cybersecurity or privacy may emphasize certain outcomes, some of which may compel an organization to develop controls. Risk assessment. A recent risk assessment or targeted risk analysis may indicate a higher than acceptable risk. The chosen risk treatment may be mitigation in the form of a new control. Audit result. The results of a recent audit may indicate a trouble spot warranting additional attention and care. Controls are important which SISM is required to know. Now we will go through the three types of controls, which are physical, technical, and administrative. Physical. These types of controls exist in the tangible. Physical controls include video surveillance, locking doors, bollards, and fences. Technical. 
These controls are usually intangible and implemented in the form of information systems and information system components. Examples of technical controls include encryption, computer access controls, and audit logs. These are sometimes referred to as logical controls. Administrative. These controls are the policies, procedures, and standards that require or forbid certain activities, protocols, and configurations. An example of administrative control is a policy that prohibits the personal use of company-owned information systems. These are sometimes referred to as managerial controls. Now, we will work on the classes of controls. There are six classes of controls, which speak to their relationship with unwanted outcomes. Preventive. This type of control is used to prevent the occurrence of an unwanted event. Examples of preventive controls are computer log and screens, which prevent unauthorized people from accessing information, key card systems, which prevent unauthorized people from entering a building or workspace, and encryption, which prevent people lacking an encryption key from reading encrypted data. Detective. This type of control is used to record both wanted and unwanted events. A detective control cannot enforce an activity, whether desired or undesired. Still, it can ensure that the appropriate security personnel are notified of whether and how an event occurred. Examples of detective controls include video surveillance and event logs. Deterrent. This type of control exists to convince someone that they should not perform some unwanted activity. Examples of deterrent controls include guard dogs, warning signs, and visible video surveillance cameras and monitors. Corrective. This type of control is activated, manually or automatically, after some unwanted event. An example of corrective control is improving a process when it is defective. Compensating. This type of control is enacted because some other direct control cannot be used. For example, a guest sign-in register can be a compensating control when it is implemented to compensate for the lack of a stronger detective control, such as a video surveillance system. A compensating control addresses the risk related to the original control. Recovery. This type of control is used to restore a system or an asset to its pre-incident state. Examples of a recovery control include using a tool to remove malware from a computer and backup software to recover lost or corrupted files. Now we will discuss the categories of controls. First, we will explore automatic control. This type of control performs its function with little or no human judgment or decision making. Examples of automatic controls include a login page on an application that cannot be circumvented, and a security door that automatically locks after someone walks through the doorway. Next will be manual control. This type of control requires a human to operate it. A manual control may be subject to a higher rate of errors than an automatic control. An example of a manual control is a monthly review of computer users. Now, we will need to discuss and explore the controls to implement, do we build or buy? The time-honored phase build versus buy refers to fundamental business decisions that organization leaders make regularly. An organization in need of a new asset, whether tangible or intangible, can build the asset in-house by using whatever raw materials are called for and by following a design and build procedure. Or the organization can buy the finished product that is pay another organization to create the asset. In years past, organizations often custom designed and built their core business applications. Today, however, the majority of organizations buy, or lease, core business applications. And, increasingly, organizations no longer build their own data centers, opting to lease data center space from collocation providers or cloud providers. In part, the build versus buy argument is related to an organization's mission and core competencies. For instance, a new social media company may lease serverless computing platforms rather than buy servers, claiming that the company specializes in social media, not data centers, computer hardware, or operating systems. Controls Development The development of controls is a foundational part of any security program. To develop controls, a security manager must have an intimate knowledge of the organization's mission, goals, 
and objectives, as well as a good understanding of the organization's degree of risk tolerance. Diagram illustrates the relationships between an organization and the fundamentals of a security program. This is the key foundation of any security program. After the control has been designed, it needs to be serviced or and managed throughout its life. Depending upon the nature of the control, this could involve operational impact in the form of changes to business processes and or information systems. Changes with more significant impact will require more excellent care so that business processes are not adversely affected. There are many factors which need to be considered. For instance, an organization that creates a control related to implementing and managing hardening standards will need to test and implement the new control. If a production environment is affected, it takes quite a bit to ensure that the hardening standard configuration items do not adversely affect the performance, integrity, or availability of affected systems. The best will be to use existing frameworks. There are many established control frameworks in the industry. It is up to the company's cybersecurity leader to determine and identify the right framework. The implementation of a new control should be guided by formal processes, not unlike those that guide systems development. A new control should have a control objective, a design that stakeholders review, a test plan that is carried out with results reviewed, a formal authorization to implement the control and IT and business change management processes to plan its implementation. Therefore, such controls should be tested before implementation. To gain the whole of the organization's support and approval, we also need to understand that owners should be present. Controls must have control owners, who are responsible for the proper operation of each control. When an organization implements new controls, Control owners should be identified and trained on the operation of the controls they are responsible for. Ideally, control ownership and training are included in the control life cycle to ensure that control owners are identified and trained prior to the control being placed onto operation. Such controls need to be audited frequently. New controls should be audited or reviewed more frequently to ensure they operate as expected. Measurements of control performance and operation should be established so that management can review actual versus expected performance. In some cases, an organization will also audit or review controls to ensure that they are meeting objectives. Latest, once these controls are put into operation, they should be monitored effectively. Controls that have been placed into service will transition into routine operations. Control owners will operate their controls and try to be aware of any problems, especially those that appear early on. Whether controls are automatic or manual, preventive or corrective, control owners are responsible for ensuring that their controls operate correctly in every respect. Modern information security control frameworks comprise a dozen or more categories of operational activities. Now we will take a look at these operational activities. Event monitoring is examining the security events that occur in information systems, including applications, operating systems, database management systems, and user devices, and every type and kind of network device, and then providing information about those events to the appropriate people or systems. Prior to widespread business use of the Internet, most organizations found it sufficient to review event logs daily. This comprised the review of the previous day's logged events, or the weekend's events on a Monday, to ensure that no security incidents warranted further investigation. Today, however, most organizations implement real-time event monitoring. This means that organizations need systems that will immediately inform the appropriate parties if any events warrant detention. Log Reviews In a log review, an event log in an information system is examined to determine whether any security or operational incidents have occurred in the system that warrants action or attention. Typically, a log review involves examining activities that occurred on the previous day. Most organizations conduct continuous log reviews by sending log data into a security information and event management system SIEM. Centralized Log Management Centralized log management is a practice whereby event logs on various systems are sent over the network to a central collection and storage point called a log server. 
There are two primary uses for a log server, the first is archival storage of events that may be used later in an investigation, and the second is for the review of events daily or in real time. Generally, real-time analysis is performed by ASIEM, discussed next. Security Information and Event Management ASIEM, pronounced SIM or SIEM, system collects and analyzes log data from many or all systems in an organization. A SIEM can correlate events from one or more devices to provide details about an incident. For instance, an attacker performing a brute force password attack on a web server may be generating alerts on the web server and the firewall and intrusion detection system. A SIEM would portray the incident using events from these and possibly other devices to provide a rich depiction of the incident. Threat Intelligence Platform Modern SIEMs can ingest threat intelligence feeds from various external sources. This enables them to correlate events in an organization's systems with various threats experienced by other organizations. A threat intelligence platform, TIP, can be implemented to receive and process threat intelligence information. For example, suppose an adversary attacks another organization from a specific IP address in a foreign country. This information is included in a threat intelligence feed in your organization's SIEM. This helps the SIEM be more aware of the activity of the same type or from the same IP address. This can help your organization be prepared should similar incidents occur on your network. Security Orchestration, Automation, and Response In the context of SIEM, orchestration refers to a scripted response that is automatically or manually triggered when specific events occur. This capability is performed by a security orchestration, automation, and response SOAR, platform that may be a standalone system or may exist as part of the SIEM. Suppose, for example, an organization has developed runbooks or short procedures for personnel who manage the SIEM for actions that should be performed when specific events occur. The organization, desiring to automate some of these responses, implements a SOAR tool with scripts that can be run automatically when these specific events occur. The orchestration system can be configured to run some scripts immediately, while others can be set up and run when an analyst approves them. The advantage of orchestration is twofold. First, repetitive and row tasks are automated, relieving personnel of boredom and improving accuracy. Second, response to some types of events can be performed more quickly thereby blunting the impact of security incidents. Vulnerability management is the practice of periodically examining information systems, including but not limited to operating systems, subsystems such as database management systems, applications, network devices, and IoT devices, to discover exploitable vulnerabilities, related analysis, and decisions about remediation. Organizations employ vulnerability management as a primary activity to reduce the likelihood of successful attacks on their IT environments. Often, one or more scanning tools, such as the following, are used to scan target systems in the search for vulnerabilities. Network device identification. Open port identification. Software version identification. Exploitable vulnerability identification. Web Application Vulnerability Identification Source Code Defect Identification Security managers generally employ several of these tools for routine and non-routine vulnerability management tasks. Routine tasks include scheduled scans of specific IT assets, while non-routine duties include troubleshooting and various investigations. Process consists of the below activities. Periodic Scanning Analysis of Scan Results Delivery of scan results. Remediation. Vulnerability identification techniques. Several techniques are used for identifying vulnerabilities in target systems. Security scan. One or more vulnerability scanning tools help identify easily found vulnerabilities in target systems. A security scan will identify a vulnerability in one or two ways by confirming the version of a target system or program known to be vulnerable or by attempting to prove the existence of a vulnerability by testing a system's response to a specific stimulus. Penetration Test A security scan, 
plus additional manual tests that security scanning tools do not employ, are used in a penetration test, which is intended to mimic a realistic attack by an attacker who wants to break into a target system. However, a penetration test of an organization's production environment may fall somewhat short of the techniques used by an attacker. In a penetration test, a tester is careful not to exploit vulnerabilities that could result in a malfunction of the target system. Often, an actual attacker will not take this precaution unless he or she wants to attack a system without being noticed. For this reason, conducting a penetration test of non-production infrastructure is sometimes desirable, even though non-production environments are often not identical to their production counterparts. Social Engineering Assessment This is an assessment of the judgment of personnel in the organization to determine how well they can recognize various ruses used by attackers to trick users into performing tasks or providing information. Several means are used, including email, telephone calls, and in-person encounters. Social engineering assessments help organizations identify training and improvement opportunities. Social engineering attacks can have a high impact on an organization. A particular form of social engineering, BEC, business email compromise, or wire transfer fraud, consists of a ruse by which an attacker sends an email that pretends to originate from a CEO to the chief financial officer, CFO, claiming that a secret merger or acquisition proceeding requires a wire transfer for a significant sum be sent to a specific offshore account. Over the past few years, aggregate losses resulting from CEO fraud exceeded $2 billion. Patch Management Closely related to vulnerability management, patch management ensures that IT systems, tools, and applications have compatible versions and patch levels. In all but most minor organizations, patch management can be successful only by using tools to automate the deployment of patches to target systems. Without automated tools, patch management is labor-intensive and prone to errors that are often unnoticed, resulting in systems that remain vulnerable to exploitation even when IT and security staff believe they are protected. Patch management is related to other IT processes, including change management and configuration management, which are discussed later in this chapter. Although engineering and software development are not activities performed in an organization's security management program, they are business processes that security managers will typically observe and occasionally influence. Most organizations do not adequately include security practices in their IT engineering and development processes, resulting in a higher than necessary number of security defects, inadequate security safeguards, and, occasionally, security breaches. Conceptual. When business executives discuss new business capabilities, lines of business, or mergers and acquisitions, security managers can weigh in on these activities with guidance on several topics, including data protection, regulations, compliance, and risk. Requirements. When requirements are being developed for developing or acquiring a new business capability, security managers can add security, compliance, and privacy requirements to improve the likelihood that systems, applications, and other capabilities are more likely to be secure. Design. With proper input at the requirements stage, product designs are more likely to be secure. Security managers' involvement in design reviews will ensure that initiatives are heading in the right direction. Engineering and Development With security involvement in requirements and design, it's more likely that engineering and development will create secure results. Still, when engineers and developers know secure engineering and development techniques, results will be improved from a security perspective. Testing when requirements are developed to make them measurable and verifiable, testing can include verification that requirements have been met. This will ensure that security is included properly in the engineering and development phases. Sustainment Throughout its operational life cycle, periodic testing and analysis of threat intelligence keeps security managers informed of new vulnerabilities that require configuration changes or patches. Also, Scans of an environment after routine changes help ensure that those changes do not introduce new vulnerabilities.
Organizations that need to include security in each phase of their development cycles are more likely to incur additional rework as protection is retrofitted into systems and applications, as opposed to these products being secure by design. Events such as risk assessments and vulnerability assessments can expose the lack of security by design, resulting in rework. Organizations unaware of the principle of security by design are often unaware that they could have performed their engineering and development for the less overall cost than the rework cost. Networks in organizations often grow organically, with incremental changes over time designed by a succession of network engineers or architects. In all but the most mature of organizations, the details of network architecture and the reasons for various architectural features need to be updated and recovered to the annals of time. This results in many organizations' networks today consisting of several characteristics and features that are poorly understood, other than knowing that they are essential to the network's ongoing functionality. Firewalls are network devices used to control the passage of network traffic from one network to one or more other networks. Firewalls are typically placed at the boundary of an organization and other external networks. Organizations also use firewalls to logically separate internal networks from each other. Examples include the following. A data center network is often protected from other internal networks with the firewall. Firewalls usually protect development and testing networks. Application Firewalls Application firewalls are devices used to examine and control messages sent to an application server, primarily to block unwanted or malicious content. Most often used to protect web servers, application firewalls block attacks that may represent attempts by an attacker to gain illicit control of an application or steal data that the application server accesses. Network Segmentation Network segmentation is partitioning an organization's network into zones, with protective devices such as firewalls or stateful packet filtering routers controlling network traffic between the zones. Network segmentation protects business functions or asset groups through network-level access control. It is a common technique used to protect high-value assets by permitting network traffic from specific hosts, users, or applications to access certain networks while denying all others access. Intrusion Prevention Systems Intrusion Prevention Systems IPSs, detect and block malicious network traffic that may be associated with an intrusion. An IPS differ from a firewall in one important way. An IPS examines the content of network packets to determine whether each package should be allowed to pass through the network or be blocked. A firewall decides whether to block or permit a packet based strictly on its origin, destination, and port, regardless of content. Intrusion Detection Systems Intrusion Detection Systems IDSs, detect malicious network traffic that may be associated with an intrusion. An IDS is functionally similar to an IPS in its detection capabilities, configurability, and detection rules. The primary difference is that an IDS is strictly a detective control, aside from generating alerts, an IDS does nothing to prevent an attack from progressing. DDoS Protection Both appliances and cloud-based services can absorb the brunt of a distributed denial-of-service DDoS attack. This capability recognizes and filters DDoS packets while permitting legitimate traffic to pass through to the organization. DDoS protection is generally implemented at the internet boundary in front of firewalls and other devices to prevent attacks from reaching the organization's servers. The advantage of cloud-based DDoS protection is the absence of attack traffic on the organization's internet connection. Network Traffic Analysis Network Traffic Analysis NTA, is a technique used to identify anomalous network traffic that may be a part of an intrusion or other unwanted event. NTA is a strict detective tool that does not prevent unwanted traffic. In all cases, when an NTA system identifies potentially unwanted traffic, someone must take action to identify the business nature of the traffic and take steps to block it if needed. Wireless Network Protection When improperly managed, a wireless network can become an avenue of attack. Older encryption protocols, such as wired equivalent privacy, 
WEP, are highly vulnerable to eavesdropping and intrusion. Employees and intruders may attempt to set up their wireless network access points. Weak authentication protocols may permit intruders to authenticate to wireless networks successfully. These and other types of attacks compel organizations to undertake a number of safeguards, including scanning for rogue, unauthorized, access points, penetration testing of wireless networks, and monitoring of wireless access points and controllers for suspicious activity. Web Content Filters A web content filter is a central network-based system that monitors and, optionally, filters web communications. The primary purpose of a web content filter is to protect the organization from the malicious content present on websites that the organization's users might visit. Cloud Access Security Broker A Cloud Access Security Broker, CASB, is a security system that monitors and, optionally, controls users' access to Internet websites. The purpose of ACASB is to protect sensitive information by observing which service providers can be accessed by users and controlling or blocking access, as necessary. For example, suppose an organization has purchased a corporate account with the cloud-based file storage company known as Box. The CASB will be configured to block all users' access to the other cloud-based file storage vendors to prevent users from storing sensitive company data with other cloud-based file storage companies. Now, we will talk about endpoint protection and management. Endpoint now includes smartphones, tablets, laptops, and desktop computers. Endpoints are used to create, process, distribute, and store sensitive information in organizations. A single weak endpoint is all that is needed for attackers, so multiple controls need to be implemented. Endpoints are favorite targets for cyber criminal organizations for several reasons, including the following. They frequently contain sensitive information targeted by criminals. They are easily lost or stolen. Organizations need help to ensure that anti-malware and defensive configurations exist on 100% of issued endpoints, therefore, a small percentage of endpoints are more vulnerable to malware attacks. They are often permitted to access internal corporate networks where sensitive information resides. Some users are more likely to open malicious attachments in phishing messages, resulting in a favorable chance of success for a skilled attacker who targets large numbers of users and their endpoints. Many organizations need to better deploy security patches to all endpoints, meaning many are vulnerable to exploitable vulnerabilities for extended periods. Some users have administrative privileges, making them more attractive targets. Being quite powerful and often connected to high-speed broadband networks, endpoints make attractive intermediate systems in an attack on other systems, including relaying phishing emails and DDoS attacks. Because endpoints exist in relatively large numbers, cyber criminals know that there will always be a few endpoints that could be better protected because of one or more of these factors. These issues make corporate endpoint management a challenging job. Configuration Management Most organizations manage their endpoint populations using automated tools, which make the management of endpoints cost-effective and the configuration of endpoints far more consistent. Organizations generally employ four main techniques for effective endpoint management, image management. An image is a binary representation of a computer's fully installed and configured operating system and applications. A typical computer support department will maintain a collection of images, with one or more images for various classes of users and various hardware makes models and configurations. Configuration Management A typical computer support department will utilize one or more tools to manage large numbers of endpoint systems through automation. These tools are typically used to deploy patches, change configuration settings, install software programs, remove software programs, and detect configuration drift. Remote Control's typical computer support team will use a tool that permits them to access endpoint systems remotely. Some of these tools permit covert remote access to a user's endpoint system without the user's knowledge. 
Most of these tools require that the end user initiate a session whereby a computer support person is granted remote access and control of an endpoint of assistance and troubleshooting. Remote destruction if an endpoint is lost or stolen. Organizations with the remote destruct capability can direct that a lost or stolen endpoint immediately destroy any locally stored data to keep it out of the hands of a criminal who may have stolen the endpoint. Laptops, tablets, and smartphones often employ this capability. We will now look at encryption and patching. Many organizations consider techniques such as whole disk encryption to protect stored information on mobile devices. This helps protect sensitive data stored on mobile devices by making it more difficult for a thief to access stored data on a stolen device. Organizations often maintain endpoint configuration standards that detail the operational and security configuration for their endpoints. Occasionally the security configuration for endpoints will reside in a separate hardening standard document. The nature of endpoint computing and the designs of modern operating systems mean that malware is a problem that will be around for a while. On the contrary, with the advent of ransomware and destructware, malware is getting more potent and destructive. This does not diminish the impact of older generations of malware that give attackers the ability to access victim systems remotely, using remote access Trojan, or RAT, software. Search for index filtrate sensitive data, steal log in credentials with keyloggers, relay spam and phishing messages, and participate in DDoS attacks against other organizations. Next will be anti malware components. There are many types of malware. Any individual species of malware may have one or more of the following characteristics virus, a fragment of an executable file that can attach itself to other executable files. This type of malware exists almost exclusively on Windows operating systems, but with improvements in newer versions of Windows, viruses are less common. Trojan A standalone program that must be executed by the end user to be activated. A Trojan typically claims to be legitimate, such as a game, but performs some malicious action. Macro an executable file that is embedded within another file such as a document or spreadsheet file. Spyware. Malware that records one or more surveillance activities on a target system including websites visited and keystrokes, reporting back to the spyware owner. Worm. A standalone program that can propagate itself automatically from one computer to another, typically using network communications. Rootkit. Malware is designed to evade detection by anti-malware and even the operating system itself. Fileless. Malware that exists exclusively in a computer's memory, instead of in the file system. This type of malware is more difficult for traditional antivirus software to detect, as there is no file to examine for matching signatures. Ransomware. Malware performs destructive but reversible actions, such as encrypting files, which demand a ransom be paid before the destruction can be recovered. Destructware. Malware that performs some permanent destruction, such as irreversible file encryption, on a target system also known as a wiper. Remote Access Trojan A rat is malware that provides covert remote access visibility and control of a target system by its attacker. Keylogger Malware that records an end user's keystrokes on a target system and then sends those keystrokes to the attacker for later analysis. Formerly known as antivirus software, anti-malware software is the presence of malware and neutralizes it before it can execute. Anti-malware utilizes several techniques to detect the presence of malware. Signatures Time-honored but quickly becoming obsolete, signature detection involves matching known malware with new files being introduced to the system. A match means malware has been detected. Process Observation Anti-malware observes the behavior of processes running in the operating system and generally knows the types of actions that each process will take. When anti-malware detects a process acting not typical of a given process, it will terminate the process. Sandbox Anti-malware will first install new files in a sandbox, a virtual container where the files will be permitted to execute. If the files behave like malware in the sandbox, 
they will not be permitted to execute in the system. In some products, the sandbox resides in the on-point, but in other products, the sandbox resides in the cloud. Deception Anti-malware will use some technique to scramble the operating system's memory map so that malware cannot attack process's memory images. Application Whitelisting Organizations can use security tools that employ application whitelisting, which permits only registered or recognized programs to execute on a system. This approach can prevent malware from executing on an endpoint and can also be used to manage policy concerning what software is permitted to be run on systems. Finally, virtual desktops will be Endpoint Detection and Response Endpoint Detection and Response EDR, represents an expansion of protective capabilities employed on endpoints. Beyond anti-malware, EDR solutions employ additional capabilities such as application whitelisting, intrusion detection, web content filtering, firewall, data loss prevention, and others, all in an integrated solution. EDR provides more comprehensive protection than anti-malware alone. An extended detection and response XDR, system is an EDR system with extended capabilities, such as having additional features or being sys-based. Identity and Access Management IM, represents business processes and technologies used to manage the identities of workers and systems and their access to systems and information. Identity Management manages the identity and access history of each employee, contractor, temporary worker, supplier worker, and, optionally, customer. These records are then used to control which workplaces, applications, IT systems, and business functions each person is permitted to use. When organizations had few business applications, organizations provisioned users access to each separate application. As organizations began to implement additional applications, users had more credentials to use. With the mass migration to cloud-based applications, the number of credentials users had to remember spiraled out of control, leading to unsafe habits including using the same credentials across many applications and writing down credentials where they could be easily discovered. IT service desks were inundated with password reset requests from users who could not effectively manage their growing portfolio of certificates. Amount of credentials needed to be managed can go out of control without proper processes and tools. As a result of these developments, Organizations began to centralize their IM systems so that users had to manage fewer credentials. Organizations implemented reduced sign-on and single sign-on to simplify access for users, which also reduced the effort required by IT to handle users' access. Another advantage came from less effort needed to manage user credentials. For instance, when an employee leaves the organization, only the user's single access credential for all applications could be locked or removed, effectively locking the terminated user out of all of the organization's business applications. Organizations realized that the Achilles heel of reduced sign-on and single sign-on was this, if a user's sole set of credentials were compromised, the attacker would have access to all of the applications to which the user had access. As a result, Organizations responded by implementing MFA, whereby a user is required to provide a user ID, a password, and an additional identifier that typically resides in a smart card, mobile phone, or smartphone. Organizations can also implement biometrics, which is a form of MFA. The advantage of MFA is that cases of the user ID and password compromise do not permit an attacker to access information unless they also have the user's mobile device in their possession. The use of user IDs, passwords, and MFA is giving way to passwordless authentication, where authentication consists of an end user providing a user ID together with the second factor such as a hardware token or biometric. Often. Access operations are performed by the IT department, while access reviews and recertifications are performed by information security as a form of a check and balance system. It would not make sense for IT to perform access reviews because they would be checking their work, and employees performing these reviews might be tempted to cover up their mistakes. Access Governance 
Access governance refers to developing policies, business rules, and controls concerning access to assets and information. These activities ensure that access management operations are adequately managed. Access Operations IAM is an activity-filled discipline that involves everyday activities such as the following. Provisioning access to new workers. Adjusting access rights to workers being transferred. Assisting workers with access issues such as forgotten passwords. Assisting workers whose accounts have been locked out for various reasons. Removing access from departing workers. Less routine events in IAM include these project-related activities. Integrating a new business application with the centralized authentication service. Resetting a user's credentials in response of the loss of a laptop computer or a mobile device. Access Reviews In an access review, management reviews users' access to information and information systems. The purpose of an access review is to confirm that all the workers who have access to information or an information system still require that access. An access review also ensures that any subject no longer requires access to information or that an information system has that access removed. Access reviews take on different forms, including the following. Analysis of a single user's access to all information and information systems. Analysis of all users' access to an information system. Analysis of all users with a particular set of access rights to one or more information systems. Various regulations require access reviews. This requires that personnel who perform access reviews produce a record of the evaluation, including all of the users whose access was examined and specific actions taken due to the review. Segregation of duties. In managing user access schemes, security managers will recognize that several high-value and high-risk roles in business processes are implemented in information systems and applications. Segregation of duties, aka separation of duties, helps ensure that no single individual possesses privileges that could result in unauthorized activities or the manipulation or exposure of sensitive data. The purpose of the segregation of duties is to require that two or more people perform high-value and high-risk activities. This makes it far more difficult for individuals to defraud the organization. For example, segregation of duties is important to avoid a single individual being able to request a user account or and provision that user account. It's also important to avoid theft and other malicious activities. For example, an accounting department can allocate roles to individuals so that no single individual can create a vendor, request a payment, and approve payment to the vendor. If this combination of access rights were granted to a single individual, it could be tempting for the employee to set up a fictitious vendor and then send payments to that vendor. In a segregation of duties access review, the security manager examines user access rights to various high-risk and high-value roles to determine whether any individuals have access to more than one role within these functions. Any such findings are identified, and corrective actions are applied. In some situations, particularly in smaller organizations, there may need to be more personnel to separate high-value and high-risk activities between two or more persons. In such cases, security managers should recommend that detailed activity reviews be performed periodically to ensure that no fraudulent or erroneous activities occur. In high-risk and high-value activities, activity reviews often occur anyway. Still, when segregation of duties cannot be achieved, these reviews may appear more often or be more thorough. Privileged and high-risk roles Information systems and applications typically have roles for ordinary users, as well as roles that are administrative in nature. These administrative roles are granted a number of high-risk capabilities, including creating user accounts, system configuration, and alteration of records. These privileged roles often warrant more frequent and more thorough reviews to ensure that the fewest possible numbers of workers are granted these roles. Activity Reviews an activity review is an examination of an information system to determine which users have been active and which have not. 
The primary purpose of an access review is to identify user accounts that have had no activity for an extended period, typically 90 days. The rationale is that if a user has not used an application in more than 90 days, the person probably does not require access to that system. Removing or locking such a user's access helps reduce the risk of compromise. If the user's credentials were compromised, they could not be used to access the system. An activity review is a corrective control that helps reduce the accumulation of privileges. Access Recertification Access recertification is a periodic review in which information system owners review lists of users and their roles and determine each user and role whether their access is still required. Like other reviews, personnel often create a business record showing which users and roles were examined and what corrective actions were applied. Access recertification is a corrective control that helps reduce the accumulation of privileges. User Behavior Analytics User Behavior Analytics, UBA, sometimes known as and User Behavior Analytics, EUBA, represents an emerging technology whereby individual users' behaviors are baselined, and anomalous activity triggers events or alarms. UBA systems work by observing users' behavior over time and creating events or notices when user behavior deviates from the norm. UBA is one of several forms of behavior anomaly detection that helps organizations detect unauthorized employee activities or find attackers who have successfully compromised their user accounts. UBA capabilities can exist in many different contexts. For example, a cloud-based file storage service can establish baselines for each user and report incidents where individual users upload or download copious amounts of information. Or an application can baseline each user's behavior and report on anomalies such as unusually large dollar value transactions and other atypical activity. UBA capabilities can counter insider threats, a broad category of threats ranging from errors and poor judgment to malice, including information theft and fraud, as well as malware on a user's computer performing actions unknown to the user. User and Entity Behavior Analytics UEBA is functionally similar, if not identical, to EUB and UBA. Many organizations have centralized logging, ASIEM, vulnerability scanning, and other capabilities, but these organizations need to be more significant to warrant staffing a security operations center, SOC, 24-7-365. To ensure complete coverage, including coverage for sick days, vacations, holidays, and training, 12 personnel may be required to staff a SOC, not counting the SOC manager, software licenses and the necessary equipment and space. For this reason, many organizations outsource the monitoring of their SIEMs and related activities to a managed security services provider, MSSP, aka MSS. Modern MSSP's capabilities include the following. Managed SIEM Managed Vulnerability Scanning Managed Data Loss Prevention Managed Endpoint Security Monitoring Managed Detection and Response, MDR Security Incident Response and Forensics MSSPs monitor events and incidents in dozens or hundreds of customer organizations and have a large staff to ensure complete coverage of peak workloads. Because qualified security personnel can be challenging to attract and retain, many organizations are turning to MSSPs to offload routine tasks and free themselves of the burden of staffing and running ASOC. Organizations that outsource parts of their security operations to an MSSP need to be mindful of several considerations, including the following. Operational Partnership An MSSP typically performs a monitoring function but, in most cases, does not take immediate action. Therefore, when the MSSP identifies an actionable incident, it hands off the incident to someone in the customer organization to take the necessary action. Service Level Agreements An MSSP typically publishes a schedule of SLS so that customers understand how responsive the MSSP will be in various scenarios. 
Organizations should regularly test their MSSP to verify that events are being monitored and comply with the SLS for alerting in response to events. Data governance is the collection of management activities and policies that seek to enforce business rules concerning access to and use of data. ISACIA defines data security as those controls that seek to maintain confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. Data security is the heart of everything concerned with information security laws, standards, and practices. Several topics concerning data security are discussed here, including some of the following. Access management. Backup and recovery. Data classification. Data loss prevention. Cloud access security brokers. Access management. Access management is part of the broader discipline of IM. This topic is described in detail earlier in this chapter in the Identity and Access Management section. Let us look at each in detail. Backup and Recovery Many events can damage information, and some circumstances compel an organization to revert to earlier versions of information. Copies of stored information must exist elsewhere and in a form that enables IT personnel to load this information into systems so that processing can resume as quickly as possible. Backup to tape and other media. In organizations still utilizing their IT infrastructure, tape backup is just about as ubiquitous as power cords. From a disaster recovery perspective, the issue is probably not whether the organization has tape backup but whether its current backup capabilities are adequate in disaster recovery. There are times when an organization's backup capability may need to be upgraded. If the current backup system is challenging to manage. If whole system restoration takes too long. If the system lacks flexibility concerning disaster recovery, for instance, a high level of difficulty would be required to recover information onto a different type of system. If the technology is old or outdated. If confidence in the backup technology is low. Many organizations may consider tape backup as a means for restoring files or databases when errors have occurred, and they may have confidence in their backup system for that purpose. However, the organization may need more confidence in its backup system and its ability to recover all of its critical systems accurately and promptly. While tape has been the default backup medium since the 1960s, using hard drives and solid-state drives SSDs, as backup media is growing in popularity, hard disk transfer rates are far higher and SSDs higher still, and disks slash SSD are random access media, whereas tape is a sequential access medium. A virtual tape library, VTL, data storage technology sets up a disk-based storage system with the appearance of tape storage, permitting existing backup software to continue to back data up to tape, which is just more disk storage. Evolting is another viable option for system backup. Evolting permits organizations to back up their systems and data to an off-site location, a storage system in another data center or a third-party service provider. This accomplishes two important objectives, reliable backup and off-site backup data storage. Note: Backups have always been a critical activity in IT. Ransomware has served to highlight its importance still further. Backup Schemes Three main schemes are used for backing up data. Full backup. A complete copy of a data set. Incremental backup. A copy of all data that has changed since the last full or incremental backup. Differential backup. A copy of all data that has changed since the last full backup. The precise nature of the data to be backed up will determine which combination of backup schemes is appropriate for the organization. Some of the considerations for choosing an overall scheme include the following. Criticality of the data set. Size of the data set. Frequency of change of the data set. Performance requirements and the impact of backup jobs. Recovery requirements. An organization creating a backup scheme usually starts with the most common scheme, which is a full backup once per week and an incremental or differential backup every day. However, as stated previously, 
various factors will influence the design of the final backup scheme. Here are some examples. A small data set could be backed up more than once a week, while an extensive data set may be backed up less often. A more rapid recovery requirement may induce the organization to perform differential backups instead of incremental backups. If a full backup takes a long time to complete, it should probably be performed during times of lower demand or system utilization. Data Classification A data classification policy defines sensitivity levels and handling procedures for protecting information. Data classification relies partly on human judgment and partly on automation to prevent the misuse and compromise of sensitive information. Data Loss Prevention Data Loss Prevention DLP, represents a variety of capabilities by which the movement and storage of sensitive data can be detected and, optionally, controlled. DLP technology is considered a content-aware control that some organizations use to detect and even control the storage, transmission, and use of sensitive data. There are two main types of DLP systems. Static DLP These tools scan unstructured data storage systems for sensitive information. They can effectively discover sensitive data that personnel copy to file servers. Often, users will export sensitive data from a business application to a spreadsheet and store that data on a file server or cloud-based file storage service. Sometimes this sensitive data is readable by most or all organization personnel and even personnel outside the organization. Dynamic DLP. These tools reside in or communicate with file storage systems, USB attached removable storage devices, and ML systems. They are used to detect and even block the movement of sensitive data. Depending on the nature of the data being moved, users may be warned of the activity they are undertaking, or their actions may be blocked. Implementing DLP systems is challenging mainly because organizations must thoroughly understand how sensitive and critical data is stored and used. A DLP system can inadvertently block legitimate uses of data while permitting undesired actions. Digital Rights Management Digital Rights Management DRM, represents access control technologies used to control the distribution and use of electronic content. Still considered an emerging technology in practice. DRM exists today in relatively narrow usage models and has yet to be widely adopted in general ways. Current capabilities include the following. Software license keys. Copy restriction of music CDs and movie DVDs. Adobe Acrobat PDF document restriction. Microsoft Office document restriction. These uses are proprietary and exist as islands of control as no standards work across multiple technologies or use. I hope you have a better idea of the key areas covered. We will cover encryption in more detail in the next lesson before we move on to Domain 4. If you like this video then please do like and subscribe to my channel.